Appearing with Jack tonight are Betty Davis, Giselle McKenzie, and Jonathan Winters. And now, here's Jack. And away we go. <laughs> you know, I think Jackie's getting too fat. Gleason, too fat. I hear he's wearing maternity suits. <laughs> I expect to read someday that Jackie Gleason has become the proud father of a ton of spaghetti. That's what I think that... <laughs> Hey, we're going to have fun tonight. That wild Johnny Winters hasn't been on television in five months. He's been making a picture on the coast. He just came back. He's already changed his mind seven times as to what routine he's going to do. And now he's working on a new one as I left, so it's going to be fun. And Betty Davis and Giselle McKenzie and a couple other surprises. We have lots of good people, and of course we have our usual sponsors, all fine sponsors. There's not one sponsor on this show that I haven't personally investigated and found that they had enough money to pay me. And uh, it's going to be... Uh, very, very nice show. We have good sponsors, like we have Hertz puts you in the driver's seat, and we have Mogan David Wine to make those long drives just whiz by, see. You know about the Hertz thing, uh, I'll tell you how that started. They dropped this guy in the car one day too hard, wham, and he hit. And the director of filming ran over and says, well, are you all right? And he says, it hurts. And they said, what a name for the thing. And then... <laughs> They're a very nice sponsor, Hertz, uh, except, well, they're a very good sponsor, but I must say this, um, a guy I know was driving from Toledo in a car, and if you watch the monitor, you'll see, and his uh, credit card expired as he was coming in, and... Uh, uh, you know... Uh, our show is, it has many sponsors, and uh, that, that's how it is. And we just do it honestly, and that's it. And they're good products, and that's the whole thing. But we don't sneak them in on you like a lot of shows. You know, they try to integrate them into the show. All nonsense. I mean, they try to distract you with something that isn't, doesn't fit. Like I saw a guy and a girl on a beach. He was in a, low cut, uh, he was in a pair of sh shorts, and she was in a s bikini bathing suit. And he's running his hands through her hair, see? And she's running her hands through his hair, and they're kissing, and he's kissing her ear, and all of a sudden the announcer says, anyone can make instant coffee. <laughs> so loud, I never... And then there's, a, then there's a commercial where, uh, where this, this Hawaiian girl comes out, and she's in this grass skirt, and she's really grinding away, you know, and the announcer says, starts instantly, even in coldest weather. <laughs> We have, a, we have a couple of good commercials here in New York on banks. You know that, that nice looking guy that stands in the middle of the bank? And he said, you have a friend at Chase Manhattan. Well, that's when you're depositing. <laughs> but you withdraw and fights break out and screaming and yelling goes on. And we have another one, that, was it at First National City? First National City, you come first. I was there once and I came in second. <laughs> The guy who was first had a gun and a mask and a note, and I never, it was some kind of favoritism I never understood. Then there's that commercial, remember where the, where the guy's dancing with the girl, and he says, what's wrong, Helen? What's wrong, Helen? Maybe it's your breath. Well, maybe it's her breath. I mean, he's dancing with her. If he doesn't know, he, the whole thing is, what's he going around diagnosing if he's not a medical man, you know? Or there's the five-day pad thing. Now, I'm not a snob, but frankly, I don't know anybody in my set that goes five days without a shower or a tub. <laughs> or even if it's cold, you can basin a little, you know, you can always have a... Remember the guy used to say, would you believe it, I have a cold? Remember him? You know what happened? He died of pneumonia that day. 
Do you really believe that you can get rid of a headache in 60 seconds? I can't open the tin of aspirin in uh, takes four minutes and just get a little tin open. But uh, what other commercials are kind of funny? Oh, how about those empty girdles that walk around? I wonder how they do that. How would you like to walk out of a bar and see one of those things? You know? They say that television uh, critics say it's not an educational medium, and I don't think that's true. I have learned more about the stomach acid um, than you could learn in medical college in four years. And I know all about liver bile. I never knew what liver bile was a couple of years ago. I thought liver bile was a river in China. Did you uh, know that you had sinus cavities? Do you know that we all have holes in our heads? Did you know that we all have I know I have a rather large hole in my head because uh, when the wind blows, I hear flutes, and I know that there's something wrong. There. <laughs> hey, you know, the only trouble we ever had with the sponsor was on the old show. I had jockey shorts. Remember the old days in The Tonight Show? And they really got sore. The only ones that ever canceled me because I said it was like wearing a slingshot. And, uh, <laughs> and they... They got mad, and uh, I, I, I got even. I took all mine, and I had them starched and sold them as catcher mitts. <laughs> you know, the thing that really does bug me as a parent, and as, as it, it would you too, uh, you as parents, these commercials that they put on for the children and advertise these things which they don't really have the thing that they're showing. And uh, you know, because they, they say, you know, buy this and you'll have this wonderful game of war and everything. And it looks something like this. They, they run this film and the announcer says, uh, hey kids, get your mommy, get your daddy, because there's the greatest new toy this year. Just keep your eye on this action. How about that, kids? It's the greatest. It's more fun than anything. You'll have the time of your lives with this wonderful new war toy. Lots of action, lots of fun, lots of surprises. Be the first on your block to have one of your very, very own. Only $24.59, slightly higher, west of Atlantic City. <laughs> well, you get it. I sent for it, and it's just a little lousy can. <laughs> The lovely voice of Giselle McKenzie is here tonight, and uh, as usual, we have some pictures taken at her home last week before she came to New York from Hollywood, and I'd like you to see it now. This is the, uh, the home of the uh, Shuttleworth. She's married to Bob Shuttleworth, a fellow, uh, or he is also a Canadian, and they live out in uh, Encino, where Giselle is the honorary mayor. They have two children, uh, both Bob and Giselle are Canadian-born. He was a band leader, and... Uh, Giselle played the violin, and it was he who turned her into a singer. This, these are the children. There's little Mac. He's uh, 18 months, but that there is Giselle, or Gigi. She's six months old. That's little Mac. He's uh, 18 months old. Handsome children. And like all of the parents, we've gone through this bit. There, see? Sweet little boy. Yeah. Giselle has, uh, she's crazy about uh, animals, and she has uh, two poodles, two long-haired dachshunds, a minor bird, Mo, a Siamese cat, an alley cat, a canary, Fred, and two finches. Tonight she's going to sing for you a wonderful song from Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. Uh, that is, uh, I'm Going to Build a Mountain. And from the new British show, Oliver, um, the song is, um, uh, uh, I beg your pardon? I could write a new one in the meantime. What is it? <laughs> as long as he needs me. Ladies and gentlemen, Giselle McKenzie. <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna do it, only know I'm 
gonna try Gonna build a daydream From a little hope Gonna build a daydream Up the mountain slope Gonna build a daydream Gonna see it through Gonna build a mountain and a daydream Gonna make a more come true Gonna build a heaven from a little hell Gonna build a him so much when he is gone, but when he's near me, I don't let on the way I feel. the way he thinks he should, but all the same, I'll play this game his way, as long as long. 
life is long I love him right or wrong And somehow I'll be strong As long as he needs me If you've been lonely Then you will know When someone needs you, you love him so. I won't betray his trust. Though people say I'm lost, I've got to stay true. John. Did you ever see such commotion in a studio in your life? <laughs> Half the band just went out to do another show. I don't know. <laughs> I, never, I heard him bubbling and moonlighting, but I never saw him doing a show during a show. Like Half the orchestra just walked out to another show. Oh, that's no way to treat a star. Sounds like you're paying Jack Benny prices. <laughs> Listen, uh, my dear friends, you will have a time now. It, it is true when I talk about Johnny. Uh, we are all derivative. Uh, comedians are derivative from something. I mean, uh, some of us are copies of Hope in a way. Some of us came from the Fred Allen School. I myself am a, probably derivative of something. I don't know. I, uh, uh, maybe Robert Benchley and Sacco and Vanzetti. Somewhere in there is where I fit in. But here, ladies and gentlemen, is a real original. There is no other Jonathan Winters, and he's the best there is. Now, welcome this guy. Johnny! Good evening. That's kind of an American approach, isn't it? Hi, folks. Um... I guess, I'm sure, one of the big pictures today is Mutiny on the Bounty. And you see it in all the magazines, hear about it on radio, television. It's everywhere. Kids carry little boats with them. You see them standing like this on the street. Ah, sink it! You know. Uh, I saw it, of course, with uh, Clark Gable and um, the other fellow, Charles Lawton. The other fellow, imagine throwing something out like that, the other fellow. Um, but at any rate, this is a story about the sea, and it's about one of my favorites. I always love the ocean on calm days. And I went through two typhoons, and they weren't too calm. But uh, I'm not going to tell you about my problems at sea. But at any rate, this is about Moby Dick. It's a story of a wonderful whale with a key in its side. But in my picture, if you saw the picture, you couldn't miss it. It was made up in sections, you know, the head moved, and then the middle, and then the tail. And it was about Moby Dick, which is a whale, and Ahab, who was played by, I think, Gregory Peck. Great, good-looking guy. My uh, fella is uh, named Arnold, and he's kind of a sissy. In fact, he's scared to death of the whale. And he's brought his mother along with him. And, uh, you know, it's supposedly true that women are bad luck aboard ship. But Arnold doesn't believe this. And as the scene opens, we find Arnold and his mother, a big burly devil, just called It, and uh, these guys pulling oars. And Arnold is looking out in the sea for Moby Dick the whale. Where is it? <laughs> Oh. All right, lads. Heave ho, 
don't use that word. <laughs> Just tell him to pull the oars. <laughs> you know, funny. Heave is such a funny word. Well, you're kind of a funny guy. I still say you're a bloody sissy. Sit down. <laughs> Tell him, Mom. He isn't a sissy. He's my boy. Well, all I've ever seen him catches them bloody flounders. Well, he'll catch something today, won't you, Arnold? Yes, I will. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There's that big devil. Where are my harpoons? Yeah, take one of these. One at a time. <laughs> Cost money. I don't know where to stick him. They say if you stick him in the tail, I just go crazy. Oh. How could you miss a whale? Well, get closer. Come chicken out now. I've got some hand lines over. Shut up, mother. Oh, that's one. How many have we got left? Seven. Get in closer. Row, you little devils. All right, come on, Arnold. Throw it, will you? I will, I will. <laughs> now just hit him in the eye. Look at him, twisting and turning. Oh, isn't that a beautiful water spout? It's like somebody's got a lawn hose inside his mouth. But, ah, shut up, Arnold, and kill it! That's a pretty thing to kill, it's so big. I'll just keep throwing these things and sticking it. Ah, we're out of them, I guess. Throw some oars. Uh, throw this. How's that? <laughs> Somebody threw a, a, a weapon at him. <laughs> Wait a minute, Arnold, there's a signal. Is it really? Oh, yes, it is. Give me my spyglass. Not that one with the silly things. Give me the real one. <laughs> Somebody help me hold it. It's heavy. <laughs> I don't understand signals. Tell me what he's saying. It says Thomas A. Edison has invented the light bulb in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Really? Oh, gee. About 50 million tons of blubber. And gosh knows how many barrels of oil just shot. Just wait we get back. When I get my hands on that guy from Menlo Park, I'll just squeeze him silly. After the first show, I don't mean to repeat myself, but I did, and I'm not, I'm not bragging, I have to tell you this because of something else, I did get a call from the President of the United States at my home, and we had five extensions, and when the call came, all of my friends that were there that night ran to the phone, and were listening to Mr. Kennedy, with our little conversation, and uh, I, I'm, I say this now, I hope the President understands that he doesn't think I'm, uh, he, he heard all this heavy breathing, I hope he doesn't think I, <laughs> I, I'm either passionate or have asthma or something. <laughs> But I must tell you that yesterday morning I got a call from the president and I talked like a fool, sir, and, and I'm, yes, sir, and, and, and yes, sir. And it wasn't the president at all. It was this nut who called me. And uh, for fully three minutes I was saying yes, sir, and, uh, I, I, and, and I said a lot of personal things that, that I thought were the uh, apt to say at the time. And he sucks me in and goes on, and he solves the whole Cuban crisis on the phone to me. And then I realized, what would the president and I think be telling me about Cuba? I mean, I know they need my help, but not in every little detail, see? This nut, nut. He, saw, he, he can do the, he just sounds just like the president. Not exactly like him. He has a plan to save Cuba, listen to this. this well, is telling me. my plan was this, Jack. One jack to another. Uh, it has been my feeling right along 
And uh, I tried to get Congress to go along with me, my friends. <laughs> Lyndon, who I saw about a year ago. <laughs> we, uh, little, little short piece for National Geographic. But um, at any rate, it was my plan, has been from the very start for this whole entire situation. I've seen the photographs of the missiles uh, and Cuba. As you can tell, I've been working. He on was a, telling me. All I've been stuff. working on uh, on the word Cuba. <laughs> and uh, I said it is my plan to bring in people like Marlon Brando and have a have a frigate about uh, two thousand yards off. Uh, have a, a spaceman, maybe four or five. Uh, have a caveman. Have a, a paper dinosaur. And to confuse these people. So that they wouldn't know just what was coming off. Naturally, my plan was turned down. It really, it really hurt me, Jack. And that's the reason I called. <laughs> it's awful nice. Uh, but I, 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 you did make a complaint. You must never interrupt oh. the president. Wait a minute. all my life to take over. <laughs> Don't cry. Especially with a, a wristwatch that small. You can drown its numbers. It's kind of a wild thing, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. That's all right. Go ahead. In show business, you can become a star in many different ways, especially in Hollywood, where talent in many cases is only a secondary necessity. Our next guest is one of the rare ones. She's an actress first, and then a star. When you use such words as class and style, you're using words synonymous with our next guest, one of the greats, Miss Betty Davis. That's a bigger hand than the president got. <laughs> I want to tell you something. This is a pro. She has laryngitis, and that's the old excuse, you know, laryngitis. When I heard that, I said, that Betty Davis was... Did you think I wasn't coming? I thought it was... See, <laughs> at last... I do apologize, Jack. It's a horrid way to do a show. You should really get your money back. I no, think. no, no. I'll no. give you a free show later with a full voice. I really <laughs> will. Well, well any, sorry, any kind of free show will do, Betty. <laughs> Maybe we can work in Johnny. So. <laughs> well, we're delighted. Well, she had a Oh, she reached over and touched me, and I just almost caught her hand. You know, but uh, oh, well, thank you. That does a little something for me, Betty. Miss Davis, I'm sorry. It's quite all right. That is quite all right. All right. Your voice is, is finally deeper than Flula Bank is, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. You know, the incredible thing about this, what happened to baby Jane, uh, it's a frightening picture, I gotta tell you this. Johnny and I went, to, Johnny Winters and I, I went to see it the other night, two nights ago, up in the village, where we, where we live. And uh, we sat in the balcony, and we were scared to death. Really? It's really frightening. We didn't hold hands or anything like that. It was just a... <laughs> <laughs> it's a frightening... Three boxes of popcorn is what we did. <laughs> but, it's a fr but this picture is incredible, because in one week, just in the eastern section, just of New York, this one picture has made back its original investment. Isn't that true? Yes, more. Yes, it's a very small budget. And film. tell what the, the wise guys in Hollywood said when they tried to promote money well, for you and Joan. this is kind of a victory. Uh, a terrific victory for Robert Aldrich, who had the idea of this Crawford and me. And wherever he went with this film uh, to raise money to make it, the Hollywood people would say, those two old broads, I wouldn't give you a dime. <laughs> and, I, but for him, I guess the two old broads would have been recast. And uh, we, we owe him a great deal. And I, I must say, um, we're not feeling charmingly victorious. We're a little gloaty. You should. Really good. Do 
you feel, Betty, that it's an extension of your career where you had great tragedy for about ten, eight, ten years? Or uh, you, is it a new career, or is it just a... Well, actually, as far as anybody coming to see a film, it's a whole new career. In the past ten years, I've made quite a few. Uh, they're on the books as total losses. And you're really only judged in, in, in Hollywood by your last film as regards... They don't care if it's good or bad, if it makes money. So at least finally I'll be on the books as a potential money maker. And believe me, that's a new career for me. You know, when I, when I haven't read something, I, I say I haven't read it, but I have read your book. And uh, this book is uh, the love. You know, for years I've watched you. You know, have people's books, and, and I said, please ask Mr. Barr not to have the book actually there, but of course, what can I do you have it? I'm sorry. But it's kind of odd that the book is mine this time, because, you know, you, you've been really so wonderful to so many, and I'm kind of a shy about this, you know? Well, you shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, of all the, uh, of, of the uh, autobiographies that are written about show people, I think this is one of the best, if not the best. It has the most wisdom, it is the most honest. You were, you were almost too honest, Betty Davis, about some things, I thought, but that's, you wrote it that way. It, it's, it, I swear to you, it's quite a book. And the tragedy that this great star has had in the last years, uh, other unhappinesses which are not our, not our concern, but uh, the problem... Uh, may I discuss uh, a thing uh, with you that was in the book? Yes, you anything mind? Well, you know, there'd be no curves with me. This thing with Winchell. Oh, about the cancer of the jaw. Yeah. Yes, this is quite a serious thing. Uh, I did have osteomyelitis of the jaw. I sounds if I had worse of the throat. <laughs> they got cancer of the throat. <laughs> um, which in itself is a rather serious operation, but it is not a cancerous condition. And the day I was released from the New York hospital after about six weeks of sheer hell, I might add, Mr. Winchell printed, and it was the beginning of his own cancer drive. So it kind of brought it home to people to give a little more. I think if Miss Betty Davis also had cancer. But it was a diabolical thing to do because this can wreck a career. This can frighten producers, let alone people who love you, let alone yourself. Because my doctor thought I would think that he had not told me the truth when I read this. And I must say, it was a pretty startling thing to read. Did he ever retract it? Um, you know about retractions. The original harm is the original statement. Mrs. Schrift of the New York Post had one of her very expert reporters write a long story, <clears throat> which was, I'm undyingly grateful to her for, because it's a sinful thing to do. Yes. This is not just idle gossip where you and I are seen out together, would we were, were or not, you know, and we get kind of angry because we weren't. This is affecting somebody's entire life. Don't you believe on the whole that gossip columnists and that kind of ilk and life has, is passing from our scene? Don't you believe they've been so joked about and laughed at uh, that they no longer... If I think the public, and I have to give you a great compliment, I think you have educated the public more about the sins of the gossip columnists than anyone I know. <laughs> It's very hard for the public to realize to what lengths certain people will go to just fill a column. Yeah. And um, may I use the phrase I used about newspapers? Is that proper on the show? Oh, I, almost anything goes here. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when I was very young and, and was in the beginning getting many untruths said about me, it hurt terribly. Number one, my mother always said to me, Betty, remember one thing the best fruit the birds pick at, which is true. If they don't talk about you at all, you are dead. And the other remark is, yes, today's newspaper is tomorrow's toilet paper. <laughs> so do it. <laughs> but when a man states that you have cancer, 
And something has to be done about this. This is a sinful thing. Well, I think he's been taken care of. Uh, listen. Well, I think the time we'll take care takes of care of all evil people. I do believe you know, that. I they do hang that. themselves eventually. Yeah. Sometimes it takes too long yeah. to get impatient. Well, we Wait. speed it up a little now and then. You know, we push him a little. Well, you bit. helped a little. You, hey, listen, you know what? Hey, Betty. What? Do you mind, Ahab, if, 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 if would you teach us to smoke, like you do? What do you mean they say I do? I want to have five. You have a camp there, dear? You do it. Of course, I only can't in here. All right. Giselle? I no, don't smoke, but I'll no, try. I'll try. I have to have a camp. Here. <laughs> Are we all going to do it? Would you uh, stand up? Now, what do we do? I want to learn to Well, I'll show you what they do. Right. I stand up, Mr. President. Yes. <laughs> First, do you want to try to? Light it, I'll try. Yes, come. I'll try. Well, you have to light it. No. You have to light it. Don't you have lighters? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you are. How about yourself? <laughs> just, get, just give it a good one. In the first place. I wish you wouldn't cough with candy. If you don't mind. Don't mind. <laughs> it is not the cigarette. Don't you? This is the result of 22 theaters on a Greyhound bus. This boat. Hurts so. put you in the driver's seat. Yes. Yeah. Place. What happens now is the imitators imitate a man named Arthur Blake, oh, yes. who first he imitated me brilliantly. He was funny. But now they've gone a little far, but it still is a compliment. But anyway, this is the first thing you do. You pop like mad. <laughs> now, the same time you pop like mad, you rotate this. <laughs> and then, and then you say, Pita. 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 An interesting thing about it is, you know, we all, in, uh, uh, those who do impersonations of Betty, and she's one of the most impersonated, pizza, pizza, always pizza. She tells me there never was a picture or any part where she ever played opposite a pizza. Never, right? never had any do. See? Okay. I think Arthur must have blended, you know, pizza, give me the letter. And oh. it went together well. Anyway, pizza's become one of my great friends. Hey, tell, listen, tell me about the Oscar, too. I, did you ever know how the word Oscar came? It came because of her husband's, uh, uh, Middle name first. Middle name, yeah. Well, um, many years ago, I won my Oscars. They are very tarnished. But the first one... <laughs> the first one I won, the rear view of the Oscar is much more attractive than the front view. It is really the cutest family I ever saw in my life. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for the first years of my marriage to Mr. Harmon O. Nelson, I did not know what the O stood for. He would not tell me um, in a way I can understand. And he finally admitted his name was Oscar. And there seemed to be a resemblance to me between the posterior of this statue and my husband and I said, as far as I am concerned, I shall always call the statue Oscar. And that's how it started. <laughs> Sit down, please. Now, uh, you can see that there's a girl who's, uh, who's really uh, got a little large. This is real oh, large. I'm so embarrassed. Oh, no, we're so delighted. You, you know, it makes everybody else feel hoarse. I know. If anybody tried to speak, they would have... No, it uh, yes, it does do it to you. No, it doesn't. It's something. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be surprised. I've been, I've been doing the same thing. And it's... I've been having to plug my picture, Jack. And I just walked around the various theaters. And no transportation at all, Betty. You go to hell. <laughs> And Hurst will put you in the driver's seat. That's what I was saying. 
<laughs> we'll be right back after this show is closed. Wait. I mean, for a word, a word from Ronson. This is Anthony Ingolia, former novice with the Trappist Order. Assistant Warden Ben W. Jones of the Texas Prison System at Huntsville, Texas. Jefferson Baird Thorne, teacher of English, French, and Latin at Winchester, Massachusetts. Dr. Robert Linton French, psychology dean of the School of Philosophy at Cannon College. This is Brother Mary Jerome of the Trappist Order. Martin Godgard, a teacher at North Haven School in Maine. This is law student Dr. Cecil Boyce Hammond. Brother John Payne, a brother of Christian instruction at Notre Dame Normal School in Alfred, Maine. And this is Surgeon Lieutenant Joseph C. Sear of the Royal Canadian Navy. This, my friends, is Fred DeMera, the great imposter. I've known Fred for a couple of years, and as you know, he was on The Tonight Show. This man has done some of the most unbelievable and incredible stories uh, that in our time. This man in the Korean War enlisted in the Canadian Navy, and they gave him a commission as a surgeon. And how did you get that commission? You, you've had no medical training. You're a genius in many ways, but how did you convince them that you were a surgeon? Well, uh, the only question they asked me, Jack, was if I believed in socialized medicine. <laughs> And at the landing at Inchon with the oh. Canadian Navy, it is, it is Fred DeMera, the great impostor, who actually opened lung cavities, spread ribs, and saved many Koreans' lives. Did you have a medical training? No, no, no. Well, you, well how did you do it? Well, actually, that's a very hard question to answer. Well, I would think so. Um, I mean, how does Ben Casey do it, or any of those fellas, really? <laughs> but you really did astounding feats. Well, I'm credited with it. Well, is it true? Oh, yes. Is it merely a, a, almost a mechanical matter of, of yes, removing? Uh, would, you, would you know when you got to the appendix? When you, saw, you know that? Well, the appendix is the end. When you get to the end, you know it. <laughs> oh, I hate a smart imposter. <laughs> but, you, the, you see, this story is, so fascinates me. And originally, when I got interested in, in Fred, I wanted Johnny Winters to play this picture, and I had a big campaign, and it went absolutely nowhere because Johnny is many people at many times. Fred has been uh, at the maximum security prison in Huntsville, Texas. He was assistant warden. He rose and he did good work. People admired him. Uh, you've never broken a federal law, have you? No, no. Have I've you ever broken? Fractured a few. I, I know, but, <laughs> but you always had some motive of doing good. Fred, uh, I'm not crying. What is this drive that you have? that always ends up in being exposed, but you've always done some good along the way. Well, I guess it's a desire to help people, and uh, I think one of the magazine writers uh, voiced it nicely when he said, I commit signs, uh, sins of social betterment and, and crimes of helping people. Well, now, at the moment now, we finally located you. You know, it's known where you are now. Yes, yes. And this time, he did, it's not a stunt with him. You see, this is the thing I try to get across. This is not an, just an, an extrovert. This man doesn't want to leave where he is now. He has a... Well, tell me exactly, because I was coming up there, but I, you know... Uh, away. I have a, uh, a Christian boy's ranch in the Motherload country in the Sierra Nevada foothills uh, devoted to the education and care of boys that, uh, that I love very much. And it's a fine Christian work. Uh, primary purpose at this ranch, of course, is is the uh, well, glorification of God through the salvation of souls. We take boys that no one else wants, and uh, we do very well with them. What name were you using, and how... Uh, oh, my I, own name, by all means. Oh, you were. Well, yeah. uh, then is it wrong to say exposed? You were not exposed. No, I was discovered, if you wish. <laughs> well, in any sense, were you masquerading as anything? None, none, none. In other words, you are actually Fred DeMer. Fred... The, these stories are just, uh, just amazing. Well, of all the things you've been... And, Fred, you know what? You're not easy to disguise. I, I mean... Uh, you, uh, no, I don't... I don't mean that, but, I mean, once I've sat with you on a teeter-totter, I'm not likely to forget well, it, is what right. I'm trying to say. Right. And, 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 and you're distinctive-looking and all, uh, but yet you've got no... Do you think you'll ever be anybody again if they'll let you... Are, are, are they hounding you up in San Francisco? No. Uh, is anybody after you up there? No, uh, actually, they uh, discovered me in this uh, boy's work, and uh, suddenly they wanted to know what the great imposter is doing in the 
in the mountains of California. Uh, it was an effort on their part to, uh, to find out actually what I was doing there and why. And uh, they discount, of course, the fact that this is a fine Christian work and, and needful of all kinds of prayerful and material support. But uh, they were simply interested in the fact that the, the ex-great imposter was now living in their community, and I suppose they wanted to defend themselves. Is that so? Yes. Do you think that if people will let you alone this time, you will stay and, and, and do what you want to do? Well, I'm going to stay. Do you have a compulsion to have to do this, uh, do some wild thing again? Or no, can you be happy no, doing no. this? Uh, whether they let me alone or not, I'm going to stay. You are? Oh, I defy them. That's the way yes, they talk. That's what yes, I like. Johnny, you've been many people. Well, what, 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 what would you, what, if you were a warden, what would you be? How, what would you, how would you be a warden? A warden? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> Huntsville, Texas. I've never been on that side of it. <laughs> they say I was a, a warden from Huntsville, Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys down there, let me tell you something. <laughs> I feel safe up here, Fred. <laughs> Two of us. Keep that machine gun on them. <laughs> Now, boys, we're going to get you the softballs. Just hold off for a couple of weeks. We're going to get some good movies for you. I want you to understand that. Believe in being fair here. Uh, be a surgeon. Be a surgeon in Canada. Uh, in Korean War, in China. I was just beginning to believe. I will do it like say. Be a surgeon? Be a, you're a surgeon in Korea at the Incheon. You, you are, you, it's awfully you, hard to operate under fire. <laughs> Bring the tonsillectomy in first. <laughs> All right, keep covering me. Would you open your mouth, please? We have to, we have to start somewhere, don't we? Ah, uh, yeah, wonderful. Here we go, let's see, page 36. <laughs> Did I get him? I didn't get him. Oh, well. <laughs> Say something. Oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> right? Of all, uh, you were once an evangelist for a while, weren't you? you, once, uh, you he once got up in the middle of a southern racist meeting uh, and uh, made a harangue uh, against those who were meeting and you, I'm told almost had them convinced the other way. You did it just as a lark or out of a conviction? Oh, no, no, out of a conviction. You don't do things much for... Uh, we're no. inclined to think you're doing it for... No. I mean, um, people are. Many people think that I go through... Uh, Life laughing, I really don't. It's been a sort of a tragic life, if you wish. Yes. But uh, I firmly believe in desegregation. Yeah. And what could we do to help you with these kids? What can uh, we do? How much do you need? We need uh, prayerful and material support. I'd like to have the best boys ranch in the United States. I'll tell you what I'll do. On behalf of this audience nice here tonight, on behalf of everybody that's here, as I'd like to be, may I be the host? Uh, may I give from the show five thousand dollars? Oh, okay. remember, remember. Genevieve and uh, Kukla and Ollie and uh, Hans Conrad and a wonderful young comedian Von Meter and also my friends, uh, we will be privileged to have the uh, new senator from the state of Massachusetts, uh, uh, Ted Kennedy, will be here with his lovely bride and uh, Robert Merrill and Phyllis Diller. Weeks to come. Bob Goulet and old Buddy Hackett, my old pal Robert Morley, Jane Mansfield, Jaja, and Johnny will be back again. Good night, everybody. Good night. The program was pre-recorded.